so now to conclude this the last part of the education to conservation and then finish the first part of this afternoon um, we will, i will ask robert ferguson so wildlife photographer here in hong kong to come and present his topic about the controversial monitoring of the government in terms of conservation and with a specific case of the lion natural education center so robert uh, i could hear that you present you already prepare an introduction about yourself so i will maybe let you do it better than myself excellent thank you can you share your screen now yeah i don't have oh here we go all right mm -hmm. and we're away thank you very much for inviting me here today and i think most people who know me know me as quite a positive guy. I do talks on and tours on animals. Um, I talk about photography. I've done lots of publications on snakes and bugs. But as a photographer, I also get to see and document things in Hong Kong at the moment. And what I am seeing today uh, uh, is very very negative. So I'm afraid this talk is going to be about a lot of bad and negative things, but um, I'm also hoping that through this we can perhaps shed a light on this for positive change. So we've got four, uh, three things to talk about today, and I know we're short on time, so I'm going to crack ahead. So the first thing is I want to say a big thank you to the government and the AFCD they have done a cracking job in the 60s and 70s. We've got 40% country park, as we've heard, just fantastic. And there's loads and loads of great projects and great people who work for the AFCD. We've heard from Wing and others. I mean, that's just fantastic what they're doing. So I, I want to say that first, but I have to say, where's the independent monitoring? Do we really know what's going on? Because it's kind of like watching the Attenborough uh, uh, TV shows from 10, 15 years ago. You know, it's underwater, it's this, it's that. It's all fantastic. And what they're doing is they're using all these different things to showcase all these fantastic things. But where is the overall monitoring? Where's the, where's the evaluation? I mean, if I go back in 2012, leading to the first strategy and action plan, we were promised habitat management for the country parks. Are they being managed according to their statutory purpose? And here we are in the middle of 2022, and we still haven't got habitat management plans for the country parks. So the first thread is, does anyone really know or care what's going on? The second thing is, well, the Development Bureau has taken all of our environmental laws and thrown them out the window. Basically, they could go to any country park at the moment under the new laws and take whatever they want. They could go to Shingmon, Taipo Cow, they can take back any of the, that's not protected by law anymore. So you've got Lokmar Chow, where 20 silos went up overnight, three new bridges to Shenzhen, and a mass of concrete laid out across an incredibly sensitive wetland for isolation facilities. Nobody could say anything against this, EPD, FCD, nobody, public, no legal challenge, because it's the new development law. And in the same way, we have a government which is Actually, I'm going to have to close that so I can see. It's the new legislation is to streamline development related statutory processes. And whenever you have the 11 green groups in Hong Kong actually getting together to concertedly worry about something, you know that this is a big deal. This is absolutely terrifying. But why do we need national parks? I mean, Hong Kong is a city just like New York and we have Central Park, right? And if Americans want to go to a national park, then they can go to Yellowstone. So why do we need any national park? And this is, this is scary because this is one of the top government advisors, the centerline CEO on the radio last year. So you can bet your bottom dollar. And this is my threat number three. 
Developers, the most powerful group in Hong Kong, do not care about Hong Kong's environment, and they have an incredibly friendly government to them at the moment. So who stands for our environment and biodiversity in government? I mean, it was government that wrote, our mission is to value, conserve, and restore the rich biodiversity of Hong Kong. Mainstream biodiversity. Who said that? Well, actually, thanks to the, a lot of work from the Civic Exchange back in the day, in 1997, Hong Kong became a signatory, along with China, to the Convention on Biodiversity, an international treaty. And in that, there were Aichi targets. So along came the Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. It's been mentioned before. Develop a strategy, develop an action plan and implementation, monitoring and evaluation and reporting. Well, it's already finished. What, what happened? How did we do? Does, any, does anybody know? So my big question is, how is Hong Kong doing regarding its responsibilities and commitments under the Convention on Biological Diversity of which we have a legal signatory to? Now I have to go to the Hong Kong Bird Watching Society and their brilliant 10 year review. You can download the PDF. There's a very good YouTube summary of this too. And the biggest threat is in very real terms, measurable terms, we have failed against 20 out of the 20 Aichi targets. We've moved the needle a little bit and there's a lot of detail there. We've moved the needle a little bit on six of the different targets and we've failed against every other single one. So I'm afraid that is our biggest threat is when you look at, okay, you look at this, you look at that, you look at a little marine park, it all looks good, but if you put it all together holistically, we are fundamentally being failed by the organizations that are supposed to represent us. And when you drill down into this multi-page report and the progress reports, there's no, I mean, I'd love a job like this, ongoing, medium term, maybe deal with so-and-so. I mean, there's no evaluation. And quite frankly, there's very little over the last three to four years, there's very little good engagement with other um, academics and NGOs. Um, I think it was uh, the chappie from OWL who was talking about carbon neutrality. Was it 2030 or 2050? Well, how can you have carbon neutrality if you're building a third runway? It's never going to happen. There was a legal challenge to that in the UK and it was stopped. I mean, it's never going to happen. We haven't even got a waste charge. And if you'll forgive the pun, my, one of my particular bugbears is this spraying of insecticides. How many cases of dengue did we have in 2021? One. Now, the government, of course, is going to point to that and say, oh, because we were spraying so much. Well, actually, it was more before we closed our borders. Malaria was eradicated decades ago, but we're still clearing vegetation around the streams near the airport because of what they did. And if you have read Silent Spring, you'll know how scary these pesticides are. And Paul Melson submitted a report in 2013, and he showed the dripping leaves outside kindergartens and other places. Absolutely terrible uh, pesticides that have been banned in many other countries. But can you engage? I mean, is it the FBHD, the LCSD, the ABCD? Who knows the, who, who, how we can change this? Okay. That's my negative stuff. I'm gonna look at a couple of positive things now, really in relation to what I say next about Lions Nature Education Center. So this is Kaduri Farm and Hong Kong was a pretty barren rock going back into, uh, into after, the, after the Second World War. But in particular, look at this site, just terrible. It's 2004 and that is uh, taken a couple of years ago. The biodiversity increase there is a Astonishing. Look at how many different trees. They've measured it, they've monitored it, they've evaluated it, they've got more arthropods and insects and birds and everything going on really well there. And another one, which is a bit of a weird one for me, because this is actually a golf club, and no, I am not a member, but why I use this one is because they have deliverables and accreditation by independent audit. And they have achieved a gold standard for environmental management. 
And I went there in uh, late October 2021, just late last year, and I was surrounded by butterflies and bird wings and common rose, very rare butterflies. And this was from a garden that they had built in 18 months. Quite an incredible private enterprise. And I used Beads River, Kaduri Farm, uh, uh, the Hong Kong Golf Club or the Fung Young Butterfly Reserve as models of how they can baseline what they're doing and show improvements compared to other areas. And I wanted to touch, because this is a bit about education, and this is a little bit hidden away, but I like this, about the diverse yet hidden relationships with other non-human animals. Basically what that means is how do we interact with other animals? outside of a dog or a cat or a goldfish or something. Absolutely critical that our young children are taken out and, and shown in the wonder of nature. So under the biodiversity strategy and action plan, we have opened and maintained a permanent exhibition on biodiversity in the Hong Kong Science Museum. Millions were spent and this it, this place, uh, it doesn't even feature on their home page. They've got no activities being run there because it's not important to them. They're a science museum. This is kind of, oh, we'll take the money and look what they did. It's like Disneyland. It is absolutely amazing. And it's being put together by communicators. There's not a natural thing really in there. Yeah, you've got big insects and how to catch a fish. And, but it's, it's not to do really with the wonders of local biodiversity, what they learn here, what they experience here, it's like going to Disneyland. Whereas I draw a parallel to the children and we have a, quite a lot of data back here already from the Biodiversity Museum in Hong Kong U, where they're actually looking at local species and the kids absolutely love it. They go in and they see real animals and real things and experience creatures. And one of the programs they have, and this comes back to my own learning, when I went into the jungles in 2018 and began to take pictures, it was a, a process of looking, finding and discovering, which then led me to do much more conservation work. And the programs done by the Hong Kong Biodiversity Museum, they teach them about cockroaches uh, and, and to go out and find them. So of course, all the kids to begin with are like, ah, like, uh, I'm not going to do it, or suck up little insects into these pooters. And after half, half an hour, you can't, you can't stop them looking for more cockroaches. They absolutely love it. They're just brilliant. And compare that to the developed program for Lions Nature Education Center. This was done by Baptist University after a lot of money and care and thought about positive attitude in caring for nature and appreciation of life. So what are they going to do? Are they going to go and find bugs and things? No, we have a dog, a lion and a scarecrow as the key fundamental pillars of learning. And they're learning about agriculture and the separation that wildlife is only mentioned as pests or beneficial to the plants because they pollinate it or eat the pests of the plants. So millions and millions of dollars is being propagated on our children about these types of programs. And that is because I know this from a local park near me. And I have engaged with this park, as you're going to see in a minute. And on one of my visits there, they closed down the net house so they had all the butterflies flying around and destroyed the butterfly gardens. And I said, the kids love the butterflies. What are you doing? And they said, this, this quote would, makes me laugh because otherwise I would cry. We do not need butterflies. We have food plants and the plastic signs to educate the children. Now you compare that to the wonder of a butterfly landing on a child for the first time and their experience of nature and being at one with that animal. How are we doing for time? So, AFCD set up this amazing Lions Nature Education Center in Sai Kung, and it had dragonfly ponds and butterfly gardens. And in 2019, and I used to go there all the time and still try, and things began to go terribly, terribly wrong. 
um, as I'll show in a moment. I engaged them at the end of 2020. I did a video, a bit of a public scandal. The assistant director said that mistakes have been made and they, uh, they allocated new budgets to the district councillors. Um, so this is what I estimate when I go into that part now. Bearing in mind that biodiversity is the key issue and mainstreaming biodiversity, particularly in local parks, is a key issue for the government. I am estimating a 30 to 75% loss of species diversity and a 60% of loss of overall, mainly arthropod numbers, particularly dragonflies and butterflies in this park. And I'm gonna show you, what, how could they do that? Well, let's look. This is the Butterfly Valley in 2015. Bottom left was the Butterfly Valley for about two or three years, just an arid desert. So no butterflies. They then replanted it, they died, they replanted it, it died, they've now replanted it three times. So this, these photos were taken in March, 2022. Look at that photo on the left. You have an arid wasteland. This remember how, how dry it was, all of that spells? All the plants basically couldn't, couldn't plant them. They've all died. And I turned my camera, 180 degrees and <laughs> there's this chappy there with this amazing sprinkling system on flowers which have absolutely no purpose whatsoever all of the butterfly gardens because they promised me and in writing that they were going to plant you butterfly gardens every single one of them has died i mean you can see this is a there's no there's not even any plants there anymore and if you walk around there's maybe in the whole park which is really quite big there's maybe about I don't know, 10 or 15 species of flowering plant, none of which really are good for butterflies. Okay, the lotus pond, the iconic lotus pond, there's me in 2015. So they blame the irrigation system, but I was actually there when the contractors went in and tore out all the lotuses because they had been told to clear the algae and just got it wrong. So this was left stagnant for two years. They went in, they, they they just destroyed the entire, they just drained the whole thing and they replanted lotuses. These are the pictures from last week. No cover, no frogs, dying little trees, no riparian, uh, no, no foliage for, the, for anything that lives in there and absolutely full of invasive species. The Arboretum has been closed for six years because of brown rot disease and the dragonfly pond, the Nanyi dragonfly pond, home to about 30 different species of dragonfly, was drained and left empty for two years. So basically, all of the pond life was gone. And even today, they plant, you can see here, this was last week, all the reeds have died, it's in little pots, and it's full of big invasive species which are basically eradicating any of the local species no dragonflies every single pond was drained for two years and scrubbed and cleaned and today the same thing continues this was last week they're planted in pots and, and if they die well the chappy just steps in again tears everything out and plants new, new flowers so that when when they have a site visit they can oh look we've got flowers and then three weeks later, they're all dead. I don't know if anyone knows what this is. This is water hyacinth, another invasive species. This, this area is actually called wetland paradise. Well, it may be if you're an invasive red eared slider, but basically the whole pond is choked and gone. And if you compare that to the farm area, you've got two or three people, you've got sprinklers, the um, the deaf people who used to help manage the park have all gone. We've now got con contractors, Johnson and Johnson, who sweep every area every day. So there's no chance for any insects. They've replaced the bushes with concrete posts. They tore down mistakenly all of the vines on all of the hedgerows and they replanted them after I complained, but they haven't, re they haven't watered them. So they've all died again. So my point is, if you look in front of the Lions Nature Education Center itself, I can, I've documented over three years, they've planted, it's died, they've replanted, <laughs> replanted, they've replanted the same area four times. And if you have any idea what that does to biodiversity, well, it, it eradicates it because basically you're taking away all the caterpillars and all the eggs. 
the trellis area has died. My lovely passion fruit is gone. That whole area is just a disaster area. Um, but meanwhile, they have spent a lot of money on refurbishing the agricultural hall. They've uh, torn down quite a lot of area and created a banana grove. They've created a Chinese herb garden. They've got a lot of nice new signs. And obviously they're spending a lot of money on the cutting and cleaning. And all the nature education money has gone on agriculture. So my point is, okay, if it's about number of visitors, I get it. And if it's about farming and agriculture, I get it. But this is a nature education center. And trying to engage them on that has been extremely difficult. Um, who cares? Whose job is it to oversee this site? My solution is in 2011, uh, Civic Exchange came up with an adaptive governance for Hong Kong country parks. It has a brilliant framework that actually shows the plans and public um, uh, uh, and, and audited numbers, facts and figures that we could actually look at. So my next stage is, is this is the first time I'm going to do hopefully a little bit more of a public scandal. I'm going to talk to a lot more people about it, hopefully engage some schools and teachers. And last night I filed a complaint to the Ombudsman about misuse of public funds. And we'll see where that legal challenge goes. So there, got it off my chest. No longer Mr. Negative. I'm doing some positive action. Um, thank you very much for listening to my rant today, and um, I hope to be back taking more nice pictures of animals in Hong Kong soon. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your presentation and this other side, let's say, of the coin in terms of conservation, because most of us present what are the hope and the plans, and you show as well the, the negative part, let's say, but it's good to be aware also at, about this. So we have a couple of questions. So how was the presence of country parks helped the community during the last two years for a source of outdoors recreation? recreation? Oh, I think it's been fantastic. Uh, I mean, you know, I think I don't have any numbers, but I think anyone who's been out on the trails has seen, uh, it's kind of like after SARS uh, or during SARS, a lot of people going out and discovering nature again. Um, unfortunately, you know, when you look at beaches and barbecue sites and other areas, these are closed. So uh, I'm not, not quite sure how that works. Um, my only point is when you look at what I would call ecotourism, when you put a lot of people into a pristine area to, to get them to encourage them to, to, to see nature, I mean, they had the same problem in New Zealand and they actually ended up having to monitor and charge for entry because the drain on the resources was, was just too great. But I think um, people being able to walk out on country trails, of course, if you walk on a country trail without a mask, you're still gonna face a 25,000 Hong Kong dollar fine. Um, so yeah, I think it's great that, that more and more people, but I don't see the government encouraging people to go outdoors. I, I think the message is stay at home, be safe. Uh, and I'd like to have seen a much more proactive approach to get outdoors, get fit, you know, get, to use our facilities. It's such one thing about the country parks is that they're great public transport system and getting to them is, is wonderfully easy. Uh, so I think more and more people should be encouraged to go out more and more. Okay, great, thank you. And the second question was, um, how we as the citizen can pitch in the mock of the situation, more visible to the authority? Like, is there any petition that we can participate or any office to write to let to move something to, like you say, because? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it's one that I struggle with and it's part of that engagement. I mean, from my point of view, I really try and support the organizations who really do have a voice Greenpeace, WWF, Friends of the Earth. I mean, Aula HK is, is great. I mean, then they they tend to sort of save the tiger, look after look after Lantau. I don't see them working on on the local issues, and I think that's where sort of you know the citizen science has to come forward and and try and do something about it. I I'm thinking of organising a petition, but but my issue is 
when I try and engage, like so many others, with AFCD, particularly over the last three to four years, I am not alone in this. I know a lot of very senior people who are very well connected, and we're just being told, talk to the hand. It, it's a very difficult situation. I think that comes from the, um, dare I say, the government government situation. And I think the AFCD is in a very, very difficult place at the moment because it, it has, it's got budget constraints, it has to tow certain guidelines. Uh, but no, to answer your question, I, I have not found a forum except through trying to do something myself to address the overall grievances um, Hong Kong Bird Watching Society, uh, I think they're, they're brilliant in, in what they do in terms of conservation. Um, so I, I would follow what they do more than anything else. Okay, great, thank you. And a third question is that how come it's possible that we have so many invasive species even after like two years of draining the ponds by the AFCD? So I am absolutely stumped <laughs> because I look at, at Pond Management 101, actually set out by Kaduri Farm, actually set out by Hong Kong Wetland Park, by anyone who manages a body of water. And it says you trap the invasive fish, you get rid of the ready. I mean, it, it's basic management. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe the AFCD took them out in a bucket and then put them back in. And I don't know. Um, certainly, Lions Nature Education Center, I would say, has been a, a center for mercy release. Uh, they put up a couple of signs, but I'd like to see, you know, po not police maybe, but policing. There's a lot of things like the, the, the coaches are left with their, with their engines running. There's a lot of things they could do to, uh, to monitor and police that activity much better. But I think a very clear warning, you know, why aren't they acting on invasive species? And I've asked the question, but unfortunately, they're not engaging with me anymore. So I'm trying to find a different way, like through the ombudsman to, uh, to try and ask that question. Because <laughs> why is it full of snakehead fish? Why is it full of tilapia? Something else is die. I understand. Okay, thank you. So, sorry to, we will have to stop there. And but thank, thank you for you your talk. Much. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. It was really concerning, at, I, I will say, at the same time. Yeah, it scares me. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, thank you for your presentation. And sorry for the question that we couldn't raise or the comments that we couldn't share with the speaker. But I will give you later the email address of the conference if you want to join us for further information, like the different link that different speakers are sharing. Also, we could the we could spare share it, sorry, and spread it through the email or the social media when where you saw, for example, our programs.